I like Robin very much. Yes. Yes. Faces, things get off. Does my voice carry well enough yeah. with people? Yeah. Or do I need a microphone? Can you manage? Can I manage? Yeah. Yeah. I can manage. Oh, you can manage. Oh. Okay. I'm a little bit deaf out of hearing, so that's why I'm sitting in the front. I think yeah, that's one of what I sort of want to cheer forward this morning because if I sit down the back, I'm not going to be able to hear anyone. I'm not going to see anyone.
Could you hold it up? Those are the men of two Scandinavian clubs first got what was published in 1990. Um, uh, called really well achieved Scandinavian because they had a particular originality. Uh, nobody quite knew what to call them, early man or two Scandinavian. Those of us who got sick of that just called it Scandia One because it happened to be that was the book that the, the newspaper that was written in um, uh, 1870s for the Scandinavian community in Palmerston and it was called Scandia because we, uh, when we wrote Scandia Two, we decided this would be Scandia One. So when we did a um, revised edition, we we did it. Uh, this is Scandia Two, otherwise known as mosquitoes and sawdust. Um, the Scandinavians are in parts of North and surrounding districts, and so that has lots more of um, like the overviews and stuff like that. Um, this one here is for Waffle Robbery. These are my own scrappy copies, so I don't think they were they're the ones that sit on my shelf. Um, there's lots more in the bits. Um, this is the book on the Jubilee book, which basically followed on from the other two. So even though it's completely different, uh, you know, organisation running with the same people. And this is my auntie wrote this one, which was from uh, from Wakarongo to from Stone Beach, Wakarongo, 1877 to 1977. So again, Scandinavian community, etc. Uh, this was. Research exercise, Massey University, really started as sort of done from germinating the food for finger, the Great Wars of the Germans and Man or Two and Rita Tiki, which um, <coughs> followed on from a chapter in Scandia Two, where I discovered that um, what actually happened during the war, and uh, in particular realised that the neighbours of the Scandinavians I was researching, no one was taking any interest in them. And so at that stage, we're still a bit sensitive, even though it was in the 90s. This ginormous thing is my thesis, um, which is um, photos I was to thank for enemy aliens during the First World War, a historic and historical inquiry. My supervisor at Massey dreamed up that title. It was a bit heavy to me, but anyway, gets them into the cost. This is my auntie's book that she did on the family, which is I helped her. Can you hold that up again now? What is it? Oh, sorry, Glimpse of the Two Men, I'll tell you the saga of Amos and Lydia here. And. Is that one in the library in the family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, this is one I'm about to do the index for. This is the one that started our box. For me. This is um, the Hawke's Bay Scandinavian Club, which is um, it's the part of this thing. And we have the rights now to reprint it. And I have been doing an index for it now for about 15 years. But we hope to get it done. <laughs> this is Joanna's World that I was talking about earlier that, that I did. That, um, uh, Typing for in, in, in a translation from uh, Norwegian to English. I didn't do the translating, I don't know if did that. Stan and Grayson um, did the actual, was the author on this, it was published originally in Norway. And when it was done, everybody over there, it didn't matter what we, that he said about the Northwood area, because they didn't live there and they were going to have to pay an awful lot of money to come and find out that he had directions wrong or. Um, missed bits or something like that. And um, so when um, I had to do the typing to get it back, you know, the whole text, and I was coming across these strange things like the how joyous it was to give birth, and <laughs> my eyes was kind of watered. <laughs> and so I got, I discovered how much fun it is with a novel because you can, as a historian, where you've got to try and be as factual as possible, suddenly mm -hmm. as a um, Mm -hmm. you know, doing this stuff, you can actually modify it slightly. <laughs> and so um, I was interesting with the contributions in there, especially where a woman's touch was needed because the guys didn't quite realise some things like childbirth were not fun. <laughs> and, all those bits. and this is the one that um, I've just been involved with as a researcher, but also I did a couple, I think I did two chapters that are in my one in that. And um, it's been had its first launch in Woodville 
last December, and its second launch has been postponed twice now and actually used for, um, uh, due to COVID-19. And so uh, we are getting there. What's um, that called? It's called Tiakatu Manawatu Gorge, and it is a history of the Manawatu Gorge. I think it's, my argument now is there should be a volume two because there's, a, there's yeah. enough stuff going on that a volume two coming out in about five years' time might be brilliant. Anyway, so we're working on it. Um, is your thesis online? Uh, I have a feeling that yes, it is actually hard to think of it. Probably complete with the missing page that I'll quite get to put in the book so nobody notices and they've got bookmarks besides the missing page. So it was uh, somewhere about halfway through my printer. As happens when you do these things, my printer died halfway through the um, printing of it to take it to the publisher to get converted to this. And it wasn't until a few months later I was looking through it. Where's the um, rest of this page? Why is there a missing, you know? Page number such and such is not showing what's going on here, and there was an accident approach. So, um, it's still minus one page, I think, and online, definitely, you know, minus one page. Okay, so we'll make a start, make a start on this. Hopefully, can people out here be hearing me okay? Can you just speak up a little yeah, bit I, more? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, okay, right, I've got this there which I frantically typed yesterday, which I'll probably proceed to end of my way through anyway because. And, uh, but it's sort of hopefully will be right. Um, so it's somewhat ominous to discover I have a speaking slot lasting two and a quarter hours. So at risk of making this too much of a traumatic um, experience, I hope it can be fairly interactive. I haven't yet graduated from overhead projection to PowerPoint, so it's down to voice project, uh, projection via a voice box that was somewhat microwaved immediately post lockdown. So if I cough, it's not COVID-19, hopefully. <laughs> I also go a bit dry in the mouth, it's called um, radiated um, saliva breed. But it's getting there, and hence this. Um, but it's growing. <laughs> um, my topic is officially the early pioneer, uh, the other early pioneer settlers of Man or Two. Luckily, the blurb also says here, historian Val Burr uncovers the fascinating stories that turn up when hunting for facts. Today you're going to get a real doozy. About three and a half weeks ago, a digger operating in the Manitou River, about two kilometres downstream, I'll read this because otherwise I'll my, lose my place, operating downstream from the Ashurst Bridge, hit a snag. He reached it at it thinking it was a log, and when it finally came free, he found himself with half an old style antler. So bear in mind, this is three, week, three and a half weeks ago. He realised it was slightly, likely to be significant as he got the blade portion. Luckily he was both shocked enough and interested enough to spend a bit more time digging his way through the entire vicinity of the river, uh, river channel that where it had come from. So quite a bit of time I understand, being paid for by someone else. Um, finally he found the rest of it, but this apparently took a while. When the two halves were reunited, he had for him a snapped Admiralty design anchor, um, measuring about it measures about a metre in length. I'll show, give you a photo in a minute. Length and about 32 inches, or well, 32 inches across, which is about 80 centimetres. So from the points of the blade, um, you wouldn't want to drop it on your foot, and it would have taken a small group of people to throw it into the river with a body on it. So I will pass you this round, and you can all, it's three pages, it's different pages, so just give it three pages, and then you can do it. It's currently sitting at Metal Two Hydraulics in Palmerston, which is my brother's work. Um, when my brother told me about it, he didn't know what it could have come from, but my immediate, immediate thought was for the issues ferry that used to be just below the um, location of the issues bridge, and that was there between, uh, Around 1870 and 1886, then the um, first Ashurst Bridge was built, and then um, a big flood in 1895 destroyed that bridge, and the ferry again operated until 1909, because it took them rather a long time to decide to um, put a new bridge in, which must have been really frustrating. Um, but until, while the bridges were, while the punt was operating, the, the ferry had a punt, it had to be used to the bridge. In terms of the pump is the object, 
the ferry is the location and the whatever's. <laughs> um, you know, while, so while they were, all that time they were mucking around doing that with the second part, so you can imagine what we're like now, waiting for the new, you know, we've got no gorge anymore, but like in that time, they didn't have much of a gorge either because nobody, not too many people wanted to go across on the punk, a little bit scary looking and all the rest of it. Anyway, um, at that time they decided to build the pier to a track or develop it because that way the huge numbers of cattle could be got through to um, the um, go over the Fitzhubert Bridge. So, you know, there were logics and all their different um, things. So, you, at the moment you've got no idea where I'm headed or if I stray off my topic. <laughs> Um, I can let you know, firstly, that one of the contractors on the pier to a track was Rasmus, Rasmus Peter Jensen, a Dane, who founded a, con a major contracting company in the Palmerston North area, and whose family's work included developing the railway deviation that is now about to be replaced by the new Kiwi Rail, rail Cup. So, you know, we find everything. Um, the second is the original Fitzhubert Bridge, which lasted a lot longer than the first bridge, was built by Norwegian immigrant Hans Anderson, Anderson Hans Eilig. Um, and furthermore, he also did a lot of the other uh, um, railway type works around here at that time. And furthermore, the um, Mandatory Gorge Road had been built by immigrants for the vote, under the voting scheme who, can't, who included a lot of the um, different, um, you know, Scandinavians who came to my throats or anything, so. Pained. <laughs> and amongst those ones was a Swedish gold miner whose name was Enoch Frederick Charles, and they are their biographers So now back to the anchor and the fascinating story. As I have an annoying habit of doing, I decided to search on papers past, if you're all familiar with my doubt. <laughs> Um, in case there was a mysterious story of a missing anchor in the Manitou River, so when the bodies that didn't get found or floated up or whatever. Um, and so as soon as I'd been involved with the Gorge book, I knew enough <coughs> stories about things that things looked familiar, but we didn't actually cover the ferry. And I sort of think now that was a bit of a, um, you know, we should have done that because it's really quite um, important to the whole thing. So that's why I was saying, Again, we should do another one about it. But I couldn't find anything about a big, heavy looking anchor in the river, and oh, it's made of um, wrought iron, I understand. And so um, we were, we sort of followed on, I followed on to all of this stuff, and I thought, well, what's going on here? And one particular bit that got my attention was the arrival of a guy named um, John or Harry, as he was known. Hillary to repair the, the ferry set up after it was destroyed in the um, 1880 flood that went right through here. And so, you know, that brings another part of the Scandinavian stuff into it, because I can put Scandinavians in. Um, <laughs> the um, people didn't realise in 1880 that there was big um, storms over in the um, Tararua area and above on the rivers, and so, you know, no telephones, you can't send messages anywhere. So um, my Norwegian great-grandfather, um, Anders Christian Christensen of Wakaronga, ended up using his baker's trough to paddle around to visit people. So back to the fascinating story. My brother inherited a pocket watch from my father, which had been given to Harry Hillary by the people of Hobson in 1877, to thank him for the many years of good service he had given him operating the Fox and Ferry, and Harry Hillary kept on op operating the various ferries on the Manitou River until his eventual retirement. So he was like the expert of ferries and things like that in the river, on this river, and this river which is the Ferro River. Well, we don't understand that, <laughs> so we're all set in the um, Anyway, so I learned from all these pages, which have now reached 40 pages of notes from papers past which uh, consists of like one line and the URL thing, address thing, so I can go back to the 40 pages to just based on one anchor. Um, I've managed to learn that they've ferry floated downstream many times, um, and so to tow the, um, tow the, the anchor a couple of uh, kilometres in loose metal probably wasn't such a big deal, but it looks pretty solid when it's standing in front of you. Um, also learned that rather than two punts, 
there were more than about more than six of them probably over in that time. So back to this, this, the fascinating story. Family connection to Harry Hillary was he was supposed to have fathered my great grandmother's last two kids, one of whom died as a baby. The other one's eventual daughter didn't marry, so there were no apparent descendants. But there was a hint that maybe he fathered more of her children. <laughs> what, but now how would they, or we, have been able to know for sure? Aha, uh -huh. all those DNA tests that we've done. <laughs> The awareness of that none of this seemed to attach it, this to our, um, and none of us seemed to have a DNA attachment to our great -grand uh, great grandfather's sister's family, also Boston based. All the relatives back in Boston, England caused a double aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I did some basic, so this is all in the last couple of weeks, <laughs> did some basic genealogy on Harry last week, and then on Friday night after leaving the opening pier, I did some research on his mother's maiden name. On Saturday, I did a little more research on the CNA Hillary and my various DNA matches, and suddenly I found a match in the appropriate lineage and at 4.40 on Saturday afternoon. I emailed my siblings and cousins and decided like, we have to change our name surname to Hillary. <laughs> uh, the response has been hilarious. I've decided I quite like him, but I agree with my friend Anne, who was president of this Manorton Standing Club, that Valerie Hillary sounds a bit old. <laughs> but I don't, and I don't see a close link to Sir Edmund Hillary, but I look at, I look at Mr. G's street art painting on, off him on the end of the Ovoe building in Kelvin Grove, where I live, as I drive across the Mahari Drive overbridge with a little more reverence. You know. <laughs> okay, so where did the Scandinavians get to in all this? <laughs> well, the, afore, the aforementioned son of Harry Hillary married, um, <laughs> newly found son of Harry Hillary, married the half Norwegian, half sort of North Swedish, daughter of the aforementioned Norwegian guy who used the wooden baker's trough uh, as a boat and they became my grandparents. So you know, you can find these things anywhere if you really try, especially when you're in a state of shock. <laughs> um, but you're quite happy about that, aren't you? Okay, so now to the rest of the non-British immigrants. <laughs> My Swedish great-grandmother died in childbirth at, um, in 1885, um, uh, leaving her husband, uh, the one with the baker's trough, with seven kids. Marie had been a local midwife, and I always find it quite sad that the one who actually most needed the midwife died, or presumably wanted the midwife. So, um, at, you know, she was about 45, so having children even at that age is sort of being a bit scary. I think you find that to be most of them. Um, uh, the, these immigrants had very limited family networks to fall back on and no social welfare system. So my grandmother, aged about four at the time of her mother's death, um, ended up adopted by a childless couple from up the road, the Dahlstroms, and they were a Swede and a Dane. Her new dad was lovely, her new mum was horrible. <coughs> she, I understand from my auntie that when my grandmother was pregnant, um, this woman jumped out from behind um, the chop shed door or something, scared the living daylights out of her for the specific uh, purpose of making her lose the baby, which is what happened. Um, so she was an awful lady. Um, however, despite that, my grandmother inherited their farm and we grew up here. So, you know, there's a, some good things come out of it. Um, unlike my grandmother's siblings, we grew up surrounded by all the things connected to our Scandinavian yeah. forebears, and the features included this, you know, the, the location was this Stony Creek Scandinavian and Roadman's block. So when my auntie Vera eventually um, started writing local histories, she was a gold mine of local information herself. Um, she'd been the Kelvin Grove post postmistress, which is always a good way to be at the centre of the gossip. We had a post office in high society, and the post office is now collected at 12 o'clock every day, from 12 to 30 or something. Um, and the family links to the life of Paul Kmith and Hall run from 1901 to the present day. Um, as Vera McLennan, she wrote histories of the Canterbury area before writing the um, book from Stony Creek Road, uh, Stony Creek to um, Wakaronga in 19, uh, 1977. And um, you know, the reason was that the school was at the heart of the study creek Scandinavian block. Now, the school building is still standing, it's a bio class, 
So it's pretty much the oldest school building in the wider region, I think, now. So um, it's not used so much, but at least it's still standing. So it's sort of quite cool. Um, and she also did a considerable amount of uh, research for, uh, for the uh, glimpses into the early man or two. Oh, my grandmother, Lydia, great grandmother, Lydia Harris, Bird. And my former great grandfather, Hey Ross Bird. Good to see that. You know, you just sort of have a great grandfather for all these years, and then he's a different great grandfather now. Um, <laughs> don't worry, Harry is still written about, but we only, as we only found out on Saturday that he was more than just a family friend. Um, okay, so I started at Messy in 1988 and ended up doing a, a double major of history and social anthropology. My first attempt at an essay on the Scandinavians in Medal 2 failed miserably, so I reminded Margaret Tim, my supervisor of the day, that that's what drove me to it, the not very good mark she gave me, because it was what happened was nobody had written on, apart from what was in um, that book, there was really um, not a lot written on Scandinavians in the Medal 2 area. There was other stuff written on um, Wire Rapper and um, in the Northwood area, but very little on Palms in this area. Just excuse me while I refresh my phone. So I was worried that my that my throat would not be working at all. My vocal cords would be working at all, but luckily they are. <laughs> um, anyway, so I've been rewriting my dad essay ever since. So that's one thing. Then in 1989, she dumped me on the Metal Two Scandinavian Club. In her place, and I ended up writing a biography, a number of biographies for this one, which was be already in the planning vision to get things done at that stage. And the fact of having no overview or index in it made it, you know, people didn't realise what was in it. And the same with the brown one up the back here, which the Hooks Bay Club has, you know, very little, and that's why it's supposed to be doing it so we can reprint it. Because it's actually, they had tend to have really good biographical information, but if you can't find them, find the information, it makes it really difficult. Um, then uh, I, I did the whole lot of mosquitoes uh, mosquito and then the whole lot of uh, kind of transitions. I have my ones, and I hate being edited, and so it's quite good when you're doing it for a club and nobody's actually specifically editing it down. They're checking it for proofreading, but they're not checking it for too long. And my theory is just make the print a little bit smaller. Make the photos a little bit smaller, which is not always a good idea, but um, I got my stuff in, and that's the main thing. But we wanted to, we were intending to do one on the sawmilling for the Nancy and Ho and various other families that we've had to hold it. It's now 21 years, but well, we're getting there. We haven't died yet. We're working on not dying. I've got a clearance in my fist, so I'm not going to die. Not yet, you know, at least I'll have a crash on the way home. I'll get rid of it. Anyway, so we survived that one, so that's good. But the downside of the, the massive biographies in the um, of Scandinavians in the area highlighted that no one was doing something similar for the German neighbours, and in the Stone Creek Stamp Scandinavian block, they were. Um, significant numbers of German settlers, which are probably mostly Polish, but technically from the German Federation, and so they, um, you know, they all spoke various languages and stuff like that. It was quite a confusing thing. But anyway, so I'd started um, doing the, um, the stuff for my post but on the German settlers. And this one here is quite an eye-opener. So what began as one chapter in this became my research uh, research exercise for the day on and the back and then became a thing as it gradually turned down to dealing with things. Um, the, the thesis on this, the internment camp, it's very hard reading about the cruel treatment of people throughout that time. Simply having an accent drew attention and it didn't matter if someone was from Scandinavia or wherever, i.e. non-German. They still got the same cold stares and abuse that a um, German person of the time would get. Um, one old guy from Robert Sly got thrown into a horse trough in Bunnington. And this is an old guy who'd come out in the 1870s and was probably well retirement age, though he probably was still farming and all the rest of it. Um, but just the locals got shitty and decided to chuck him in the horse trough. 
and that's just a mild version of some of them got really badly treated, you know, far worse treated, shall we say. Um, so, um, what is it? Uh, a lot of these stories are really painful reading. Many seem, uh, seem similar to prejudice shown nowadays to some immigrant groups. In fact, some of the worst actions on Sorens Island in Turmic Camp would have been quite at home in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq in more recent times. So, you know, when you've got the commandant running around with the gun threatening to shoot people and uh, bashing people up on the waterfront of Soames Island, or not Matthew Soames Island, that's who he's doing now, um, and, and looking like that, that this is, oh, that's what they do in Germany, so we'll do it to you here, um, and all sorts of really violent stuff. You know, you sort of think, hey, this doesn't feel like New Zealand, but they were getting information back that was coming selectively through, through the cable from Britain <coughs> through the United States down to New Zealand, down to Bia, wherever. And so by that time they were trying to um, make sure, the British were trying to make sure that the um, Americans didn't go, oh, did you, want to, did you pass that room? Or did mm -hmm. Oh, great, oh, that's right, same room, same So they, they, um, they were trying to make sure that if America came into the war, it came into it on the side of Britain. So by the time we were at the end of the cable, the um, stuff that was coming through to New Zealand was quite distorted, even on what it was. And so in New Zealand, they assumed in their um, internment camp that, or the powers that be did, that um, they were being starved, the equivalent people were being starved in the um, camps in Germany. The, this is the civilian <coughs> camps, we're not talking about the prisoner of war camps, we're talking about the internment camp people who like me, you, whatever, who had to be of the enemy thing shoved in there and didn't have any choices. And so they were half starving people and doing all sorts of stuff when they didn't need to. But in Germany, the same type of thing was happening because there was no food and they were in a war zone. So there were different circumstances. But um, Major Matheson, who was Ian's close relative, <laughs> um, was um, not the greatest. He sort of put a school teacher in front in charge of an internment camp. You don't wind up with necessarily somebody who can cope with a lot of wayward people. It was actually when I did that, it was actually good knowing Ian really well as a mentor and all the rest of it, because I don't think I would have seen Major Matheson in the same light had I not known Ian, who was also an ex school teacher. <coughs> so, you know, you don't even know where things are going to go in with these things. He had a good chance to be at once, but he got sick and died. And so that was very unfortunate, but he, it was very helpful to me to know it. Um, so the language was also it was impeded, this is of all these different ones, at an early stage. The New Zealand government could, would not allow children to be taught in languages other than English at school, and it must have been hard for the kids as they had no English at home. And so you can imagine that with the Maori as well, where they weren't allowed to be taught in their language. And so um, at Stony Creek School, the children were sent out to play in the playground where um, they could at least communicate with each other. And there was a whole array of languages there. Now, when my kids and, and I were going there at various times, there was a great many Chinese kids. And so I can actually relate to that because we were seeing kids coming through from China and working on the, their parents had the, working on the farms there. And they were, um, they could, they'd arrived at school and couldn't speak English and had to gradually learn amongst everyone. So yeah, it was quite an interesting school to go to when you're looking back as a historian on what it was like back then. So very much a um, thing. And so one of the two ships brought um, families to the men or two included a Danish wife who was a teacher, but she was not permitted, or will, not willingly, shall we say, permitted to help out either at Stony Creek School or after the family moved to Danny Bird. Um, Do you have her name by any chance? Jorgensen. Thank you. Why? Oh, no, I have an interest <laughs> in the Danish. Uh, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's no yeah. room about there. So, um, yes, so when you sort of get, come to those things, oh, incidentally, Major Matheson also taught at um, a Stanway school where he was familiar with German families, but not familiar enough that he treated them nicely in the same zone. And he also taught at Turatia school. And, um, oh, Turatia? No, the Linton school, sorry. And his boss taught at to a school, so they sort of think oh, it's all a matter of two, and you think, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, 
anyway, so the men learned some English when they were working as um, on the public work scheme. So the women had, and the kids had to learn at school, but there was nothing for the immigrant women. Um, the sad end result was by the end of the time, these women had grandchildren, when they had grandchildren, um, sometimes they couldn't speak to them because the children didn't have the language, grandchildren didn't have the language. So that's quite a painful thing to sort of think about, and that story actually comes from out the Stanway area. But it would have also applied in Denbert and uh, elsewhere, etc. And during World War One, it was not a good idea to speak in the native tongues. They had a, they, uh, they had a, was a good way to get. They were a good way. To, uh, typo. <laughs> they were a good way to get a negative attention at war to get one's church burnt down, such as it helped them in World War Two. The Martin German Lutheran Church still survives because people took to sleeping inside it when attempts and attempts were made to burn that one down too, so it's lucky to still be there. In addition, streets with um, non-German, non-British names were changed even if the person they were named after wasn't German. For example, Fritz Street in Palmerston North was named after the um, Norwegian former mayor and um, timber mill, Miller Fritz Jensen, and, and it became um, Russell Street after a New Zealand general in the First World War. That one, that one I think, was 1917. Others were even less confident, uh, confrontational. For example, re when recently researching the origins of the name of Jersey Lane in Palmerston North, I discovered that shortly before its name was dropped off, um, Jersey Street had been renamed and the, that the family who named it were from the British island of Jersey, but their surname was not politically correct. So their surname and their home island got deleted from the town's road. Another sweet. Come get me. Thank goodness this wasn't about two months ago. <coughs> <coughs> um, right. Uh, where are we? So to more or less conclude, so we'll get a little, we might get out of here before. More or less good, but a few more paragraphs here. At Palace North, only two shiploads of non-British settlers arrived on the immigrant ships, Salino in England in 1871. My forebears were, on, um, were amongst the 18 couples on the Salino, the first ship to bring the people, whose people, and they arrived um, in February of that year. Most were from, were from Norway with a few Swedes as well. The um, government had planned that they would write letters home and attract others to follow them. Those people being destined for such desirable places as the dense forests of the 30 mile bush and the 70 mile bush, miles from the system and long before they could really prosper them at all. Meanwhile, Paris North had lots of potential. Didn't have much else at that time, but. <laughs> um, and um, so the Im immigrants wrote away. A few days later, the rains <laughs> fell, and so, so, so that soon the immigrants were clinging to the roofs of their new little houses they just built as the water swelled around them. So these people had been settled in what was called the Kareri Scandinavian block, and this was, this was between Westbrook and Longburn, the brook part being the Mungoni stream, which is pretty big. <laughs> We have lots of issues with that, don't we? Whole suburbs go underwater and stuff. My great great grandparents were amongst the worst affected families who were um, relocated to the Stony Creek block. Um, then a few weeks later, the second ship arrived, which was called the England, um, with 77 Scandinavians on board, mostly Danes, with some Swedes and 12, including 12 married couples, 11 kids, 39 single men, and three single women. These were settled, or men, uh, the single women and elsewhere, but um, the men, um, this, uh, they were all settled on the Stony Creek block where, as the mar married, but where as the married couples actually settled, the single men in most cases moved on to the farmland, they were uh, moved off the farmland, they were put on because the land was too small, it was 24 acres and it was covered in bush and without the women to sort of slave away while the men were on the roadworks. Um, nothing happened, so they just basically gave up and walked off. And that's actually where our farm came from. It's one of these abandoned farms. But where the second time round, um, they put a married couple in, which was the nasty stepmother, the wicked stepmother, and her lovely husband. So it's amazing how the grandchildren remember these people <laughs> that way. Um, and um, the other thing that happened is the Danes were soon considered the least 
least capable as bush workers of the three nationalities. Because while the Norwegians and Swedes were comfortable in the hills and the forests, um, the Danes were off flat land and they were used to the trees, etc. However, when the Danes when the farming actually started, the Danes were, you know, the cream of the crop as such because they were dairy farmers and stuff, so you get your Danes come out of it anyway. I've got a story about a, um, a true uh, Danish um, bush teller oh, yeah. uh, that will contradict what you said. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all right, we'll get back yeah. onto it, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that would be right, you, all, you don't always get them. He's okay. from Yeah, you probably have to be a pretty good one. <laughs> um, this, this was sort of in the local area. Um, nowadays, uh, we have remnants, less remnants of Scandinavians and other non-British traces in the Palms North area that would be nice to have. We have the beautiful Keisha Birch House, which is built on the lines of a typical Norwegian Swiss-style homestead. It is now named after later owners, but it was built around 1896 by Norwegian saw um Jacob you know, he of the one whose um, partner had, had his name street name changed to being the mayor of Palmerston. <coughs> we have Salino Park and Kelvin Road at the heart of the former Stony Creek Scandinavian block, which is so named after a great battle with the developer after the first immigrant ship. We could call it England Park, it would be very distinctive, so it had to be Salino, which, um, and I was the one who led that, so I sort of definitely know it was a battle, a really great battle. Um, and, um, now it's just they've just put the name plaque up on it, and they're sort of now making their point of the place of um, Salino, uh, how it might be pronounced in relation to Matariki, and how it's one of the Salino's one of the Pleiades, and the Pleiades of Matariki. So it's actually quite nice to see the sign up there with all the details, which I hadn't actually tweaked to because nobody at the time we were doing it was thinking about Matariki having a potential for and all that sort of stuff. Excuse me, I've got to cough this. Sorry about this. Uh, which um, port did the ships arrive at? These two arrived at Wellington, and the ones bound for um, some, uh, for Wairarepa also arrived at Wellington, but the ones who were going to um, North with Denebeck, they came to Napier. So they had a few various ports, not many really worked out to any of the other ports. So anyway, we've got so we've got Salino Park, and we've also got the adjoining Frederick Krull Reserve, <coughs> named after um, the Norwegian, oh, the German consul who sorted out a huge mess after the um, New Zealand government suddenly announced it would take no more British immigrants at a time when the last shipload of people had just sold all their stuff in Germany and were basically arriving at the port to get onto the ship. And so um, Bismarck actually put his foot down on this, he was their leader, and said, no, these people are going whether New Zealand government likes it or not. So basically 500 odd people arrived on the Fritz Reuter in 1876. And Frederick Crowell, the consul, um, he suddenly found himself being told, oh, you've got to find, you've got to look after these 500 odd people. And you know, how would you do that when you're one person, you're not got to, Great lot of people behind you and stuff like that. And so they eventually relented and took them in, but they settled in uh, Palms, I think, out of Kaukum, um, out of here. There's quite an array of them, but they were done in a different way, a process in a different way to what the first two ship lots, ship loads were doing. So that was getting that part named after that. Well, some of them went to Stony Creek as well, to that area. Um, that was my doing. My ship's bad. <laughs> Um, they were getting, they were pretty scared after the Salino Park business, so they decided they'd comply on Frederick Crowell and Zeke. Um, anyway, so the people who came, who came to New Zealand back then were the poor ones who had little future in their homeland, for example, younger sons of families, so weren't going to inherit the family's little farm or anything like that. Um, some of them thought they were going on a ship to America and found themselves on the way to New Zealand. So there's lots of stories like that. So. You know, there wasn't much information on what the heck New Zealand was, and so presumably they believed New Zealand was part of the United States. But it wasn't. But it were all made for interesting yeah. stuff. But um, the ones that they had, the very little that they brought with them, they were told, some of them packed up some of their stuff like um, spinning wheels and that, they were told, no, you can't have those, there's not enough room for them. Um, some of them, um, like the ones on the England, 
brought their baggage with them and got it as far as from uh, Rendioto. And then um, they were told, no, we can't get it through the mud to take it to you because the, the bullocks and toilet teams were sort of like floundering through, you know, uh, to the tops of their legs in the mud. So they were packed up on, their stuff was packed up on the side of the riverbank waiting to be collected and never was. And so um, that just rotted. So imagine what you might have, what treaties you might have brought with you and you knew that it was sitting on the riverbank and you were never ever going to get it. It would have been stuffed by the time anyone did it. They, um, they, in the first winter, because it was so hard to get to Palmerston, they were reliant on um, product, produce and stuff that came from the local Maoris. But when we um, first launched um, Scandia 2, we actually did it down at Tirangi Maori, Tirangi Maori Lake meeting house down at Rinyotu as an acknowledgement of what had been what they had done for those people. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can sort of find that are relevant in that and so you, you learn a lot. <laughs> um, and um, I think, I, so the Scandinavian clubs were formed around the country in the 1970s. One guy set to work and convinced everyone that they needed a Scandinavian club. <laughs> And the one meeting was called, the first meeting was called at Palmerston North and they thought like half a dozen people might show up and the house was absolutely crammed with people and that was the foundation of the Mayor too. So that was, that was good. And the Goethe Society, in, in which I don't know if it's still going now, but that seemed to be like a German equivalent. And nowadays the new, thriving new group is the... Um, Viking Festival that was held for the first time last year, just before the lockdown. The next one is being held in February 2000 and next year, as you say, again at um, Northwood. Not quite the same as our old Scandinavian festivals, but a hell of a lot more fun. <laughs> um, and um, the theory and concept of a little bit of Led, Zepp, Zepp, Led, Led, Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song we come from the land of ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the um, hot springs flow to invade England and slave, enslave its population and slaughter everyone. That is, brings a lot of fun into it, these. <laughs> of course, we're sweet. And, oh yes, Harry Hillary's YDNA Haplo group, which my brother has had done at one time, would have been one which is noted as a marker of the Viking invasions, and I hope they were all nice Vikings. He was from, um, we remember how somebody said earlier today about um, Hampshire, somebody going to Hampshire, and they were one of the people was um, the guy who was talking from the book launch, I don't know, I can't remember who, what, what his name was, um, he was talking about relatives from Hampshire who were involved with um, these things, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, that's the same location. But nah, it's sort of been a very interesting, oh, that page in the hand, I've got written on um, it's been a very interesting last few days. You don't usually expect at my age to suddenly find a new grandfather, great grandfather, sorry. And um, so I decided I would share it here because we haven't shared it beyond our immediate family at the moment. So um, that's my little contribution to that. But um, oh, I've now got six great grandparents, great grandfathers. One of them provided the family farm, one of them provided the surname, and neither of them's biological. <laughs> so they're normal, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, it's been a very funny little last few days. But that anchor is, um, you know, like you say, I, we've practically been illegitimized by an anchor. <laughs> so yeah, it's very funny. But anyway, it's, it's that what the intention to do with that is to pin the broken bits back together and um, then have it on display somewhere, you know, whether it goes to the museum or the, um, on display at issues somewhere. But it's a fascinating story. And now I'd, I'd quite like to, as I had started before I got to this in the last couple of weeks and all this massive amount of information I got in three and a half weeks, um, I'd quite like to do, you know, write something on the history of that ferry. And um, I was sort of feeling bad because a guy that I know, you know especially with his mum, because she kept the horse at our place when we were kids, he's 
writing the book on the history of air shifts, and I was thinking, oh, I didn't really want to stick on his toes because I think that would be a bit mean. But now I've got a reason. Mm -hmm. It's my gr grandfather we're talking about. <laughs> but he, I don't think he might. Because besides, if I do something like that, it would be a lot wider because I want to take in the, the Python track and the development of that and all these other things that would make it you know, turn it into a whole instead of like one just little portion of it. But now we like, there's like there's six of us who are great grandchildren of this guy who is still alive, the other one, the other family is from Teva and um, no descendants. Um, but um, we were thinking now we'd better put a few stone on this grave. He hasn't got one and we should I think maybe we should. But the how it actually how it actually found this Lucasian one of one is the DNA thing and discover it going going through discovering some people I decided I'd research them just as a matter of curiosity and I found a um, Facebook a page rather on ancestry.com where the lady had called her thing um Hillary's of Hampshire. And I've fished my way through and actually found him there's like just some loose connection to it and she had his ancestry. And um, then I started going through my own DNA matches and um, doing some cross-referencing and trying to find something with Hillary that mentioned in it and found um, this uh, guy and I worked my way through his one and it said that I was a fifth to, a fifth to eighth cousin of this guy, whereas we had nothing on the Burr family, nothing on the sister down in uh, Foxton. And um, so I weaved my way back through and then found a match between that guy's grandparents, that ancestor's grandparents and Hillary's grandparents who were the same people. Wow, we sort of get on to the, tell the others in the family. And, so we've been having rather a delightful time since then, and I suspect that the digger driver who pulled that out of the river is going to get rather hard time when he next tops into men on two hydraulics. Look, he's changed our whole family in history. <laughs> but anyway, so that's pretty much it. So um, I think we, can, we don't have to wait until five o'clock, so hey, that sounds good to me. But if anyone's got any questions, please ask away. Was that fairy man with bad spelling? Fairy, fairy man, which fairy man was that with the bad spelling? The pump that went across the Hamilton River. They were probably all had bad spelling. <laughs> yeah, he, he operated the Foxton one, and at various times, Foxton mostly, Shannon, were a finicky you know, and also for a short time, the issues. So he, he would have been, had, he had the expertise by the looks of it to have operated more. He sent them out from. He actually had taken over um, the Foxton uh, one off my great grandfather, my poor my great grandfather. So we're kind of thinking, oh, how did all of this work out? What's going on with these people? And found um, my cousin down in Wellington. She's going pouring through papers past, and we found a bit of a um, row taking place between um, Amos and Lydia, and he. She got a protection order against her. Oops, she's just found, he's just found out that she's been doing whatever. But he seemed to be away and awful watch. And so I suspect that um, he, you know, basically he left his wife to fend for herself. And then he re reappeared and discovered she was actually pregnant and hadn't seen for quite some time. And so she was probably, well, she had a new baby at that time. <laughs> But then he tried, Amos tried to take um, Hillary to court for 23 pounds or something, which was like a lot of money then. And so we were sort of thinking what was involved with that, then someone set Hillary's house on fire. Um, and so, you know, you're sort of imagining, well, you could, based on all this stuff, you could might write a pretty damn good novel. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's true by the looks of it. You can't you can't defeat the DNA. And that is just so stunning. Do you know what it's fun. So that's the same theory as on the postcards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except it looks like there's about six of them. That, you know, that would go off sailing off down the river get damaged, they have to build a new one. And the final one was being used with a broken back. So it was sort of um, pretty much it. The end where they built, got the bridge completed.
but um, oh, it's, it's just been it's just been quite mind blowing just learning that I was like I said forty pages of notes and that's not the actual text that's just like one line of whatever the article is about plus the um, website address the web page address and it's incredible and you've got um, a guy um, you know he, he one of the first the first guy was trying to get the attention of the ferryman at that time. And got and got no answer. Tried to ride his horse across, and then got um, then got uh, was too deep, and so he gave up and went back to wait very angrily. Another one, a few days previously, they had um, found a horse wandering around in a paddock with a saddle and bridle on. It was there for three days, wandering around on the riverbank with a saddle and bridle on it. They thought the guy, oh, he must be fishing. But he was dead. They found him washed down to the um, Fitzherbert Bridge, and you know, I've written to his grave at Terracine Cemetery, and um, you know, all this sort of stuff that comes out, from, and um, it's it's really interesting. Hey, oh, one thing, my brother, when he was telling me about this, he was the first introducing it to me. What could it have been? He didn't know about the fairy, and um, I said, oh no, well there was a fairy there, and I said, and he's humming and harring and carrying on. I just well, when we wrote that book, we found that Tiraprahā took his walk, you know, ocean guide and walk canoe through the gorge, supposedly, to do so. Maybe he had the anchor on that, you know, I was joking. No, he can't possibly, it's way too big for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you can come up with all sorts of things. That's before he got illegitimised, so he was sort of quite happy when he didn't know it was great grandfather by that time died three weeks. But um no, nah, it's the the story of that theory in its own right is just incredible and the accidents and the washing away and stuff like that. So I've managed to you know how I said him the thing that he could uh, interesting things that you can find out when you're doing historical research. Well that's the doozy. <laughs> you can't really get much better than that. Because, um, oh gosh. No, so it's interesting. So now yeah, I've got to think about doing this in weeks and weeks of the past because this is 150 years or something next year to it. Isn't it? You mentioned the Jetson yep. in your notes. Yeah. Um, can you expand a little bit more? Which Jetson did you have in mind? <laughs> um, I think you mentioned Peter Jetson. Peter Jensen, Peter He's Wasson. one of my ancestors, if, if, if that's the right. Herb, was it Herb Jensen? Herb Jensen, is that your family? The yep. contract is, yep, yep, that's the one. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so he's one of the ones that I wrote about in that with um, a, a relative whose name was Valerie. I forgot their name, but it's written in the dream. And so that was really interesting. So they did the, um, the railway deviation. Yeah. And heaps of stuff. So they went on and did really well. Well, his great grandfather came out on a German. Can you imagine a Danish immigrant? Yeah. Hemmings Christian. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one I wrote about. Uh, Jensen yeah. came out on the Humboldt, mm, yeah. a German immigrant ship, and he fought in the in the Schleswig Holstein War. Yeah. Had a Danish medal mm -hmm. and the utter humility of coming out on the German immigrant ships. Yes. The Humboldt. It's also been a bit, been a bit difficult to write, but probably they weren't chasing them for the like We had. Mm. Uh, one of the ones that I wrote about uh, in one of these things here, he was German who had a um, an Iron Cross, and you know you get that kind of stuff in the First World by the First World War, yeah. and it was from Franco-Prussian War as well. So all of the different sides that people had, where you know suddenly circumstances are changed mm -hmm. and they um, are not uh, quite the um, quite as pure sounding, but they were probably perfect. they were here to get away from the wars. And, and just the point I want to make is he was a um, uh, oh, work, work with iron. Um, uh, blacksmith, I blacksmith yeah. yeah. And he trained his sons to make good axes. Mm. And uh, Julius Jensen cut a whole lot of trees around the Halcom area. And he, okay. They reckon, well, the family reckons he was the best um, um, bush fella of his day around the Halcom. Yeah, there would be, you know. He's buried at Halcombe Cemetery. Yeah, that, 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 thing, you know, that you, the ones that they had, they, were, they weren't over this side of the range, just they were over the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ones who were not very good Danes. <laughs> but a lot of it is that they didn't have the tie to the land, if they didn't have a farm and a wife there, 
that they had to provide for, they could sort of flip off and do where the money was. Yeah. But like the guy who originally owned our little farm, um, no, I don't want it. Um, they, um, they had uh, it was only 24 acres and he was not married and he went over and found the woman to, and married her over in, um, uh, what do you call it now, Northwood area and yes. she, and then they did, they bought their farm somewhere, a decent sized farm. So these were just little tiny farms covered in bush and unless they were, you know, had a reason to stay at it, there was no reason for them to do so. So they were, um, but the, in the case of the Danes, um, they were in a lot of cases not, they were used to flat land that had been cleared, whereas the Norwegians and Swedes had grown up in the bush because that's where they didn't take the town ones, they were no use to them. They wanted the ones who could do it there. But the Danes developed the dairy industry. Yeah. Um, and you know, they they had a gave a lot more after the trees were gone. So, you know, it worked out in the best in the long run. But, my Listen. grandmother can remember Peter Jensen opening up his blue vein cheese mm, yes. and the whole family just getting out of the kitchen. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, there, there are so mm. many stories. And you know, mm. the settling of, setting up of the railway and stuff like that. And, yeah. um, Accidents and tragedies and all that kind of stuff that sort of come up. Especially when you've got no doctor locally and they've got one for you to all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. Well, having Bishop Monrad at Kareri, did it make much difference to the other Danes? Because he's been high status. Well, he, um, by the time they came, he was gone. He went about 1868, they came 1871. Oh, okay. And so other members of his family were there, but they um, had, um, what do you call it? When you, when you look at the people in Palmerston, you've got the the, the Monrad family, not you know, not the, <coughs> the family. Yes. And they can, they want to be with people, control people, or can organise people, or whatever you might want to call it, through their parts. You know, saying come and go to church, go and do this, be friendly, and all that. Whereas Rick and Anastad and Co, which was Rick and Anastad and Jensen, the partnership from Trondheim in Norway, they controlled them. And, you know, just, you know, kept things in going through their wage payments, and who do you ultimately take notice of? The ones who pay you, or the ones who just want to take you and get you to do different things and stuff. So it was it was a bit of a different, a bit of a um, conflict in some ways. Not a nice conflict, not a nasty conflict. But um, that's, see, that was Rick and Anastad and Co that, you know, drew people in and kept people working. And once the, um, uh, once the trees were gone locally over there, um, they got people farming and so they opened a flour mill and so that kept everything going. They still kept them, and that, you know, like what is the flour mill that's there now, which is the descendant of it in Tremania, but it's still been flour for years. And uh, Melody's New World was on the site of the first flour mill. But mm -hmm. Terracine developed out of these, this company. So, but it's, it's a really interesting lot of conflicts and contrasts and all sorts of exciting stuff. <laughs> mm. It's very exciting to write about. I do it a lot. Thank you. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. Thank you very Looks much. Like, see, I've been kind to you. I haven't kept you all going to yes, five very kind. I've been kind to myself. Yeah. Was it your yeah. grandfather who was on the ferry? My great grandfather. Yeah. My yeah. new it, great grandfather. Oh, the new one. My you new great grandfather. My new grandfather who was a ferryman. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that's actually quite interesting. Yeah. 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 I thought it was quite interesting too. It was a yeah. hell of a shock. <laughs> Leave here on Friday night from the um, opening oh. thing, go home, look up a couple of you know things on um, the internet, and uh, oh yeah, that's it. So that's the mother's maiden name. Oh, interesting. And then by Saturday, um, back through there. Oh my God! Just the whole explosion. There. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So now I've got a novel that's real. <laughs> what was this romance like? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was its nationality? He was British. 
English 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 British. from Hampshire. You're partly British. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically quarter Scandinavian and three quarters oh. English. Uh, well, still English. Everything stayed English, but the Scandinavian's half, half was Swedish, half was English. Oh yeah, I can also show you this. I never. I wore it specially. Oh, this is a fairly really? standard flash. Um, Norwegian um, item of jewellery. Oh, really? It's beautiful. Is it gold? Uh, no, it's us? entirely silver. Oh, silver? Right. Um, these things are gold wash. Mm, but um, what it what it is that the design of these things is done so that they sort of like mirror out to um, so that they send the bad luck away. You know, ah. that's the intention. So they give them to them as little babies, the little wee ones that little yeah. kids wear. And this one here in particular. Um, Came from eBay because that's how you buy things nowadays. It's New Zealand that we have it. Now, I doubt we were too many brought them to New Zealand in the immigrant days. Um, this one had belonged to a lady in America who um, had uh, her husband had bought it in Norway. I think they were a Norwegian family, but based in America, and he'd been in Norway and he bought it for her. Wow. And she was very elderly, say 15 years ago or something when I bought it. And um, I got it here, it was quite tarnished, and so I took it into the jeweller. And they, over the next several days, they cleaned it all up. And I wore it to the Norwegian Constitution Day event in um, Northwood, oh, wow. like within about within a week of receiving it, it was all cleaned up. And I wore it with my uh -huh. costume over there. And it was televised, so I contacted what? the people and said, This, you know, and then it went international. I said, have, have a look at this thing. Here is your sodium brooch. Wow. That's that you just post it off, all cleaned up, and it's all in use. So I like to wear this one because it's got a story. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's really neat. So I've got a number of them. Yeah. This one's a special one. <laughs> yeah. So they usually, when I'm wearing my costume, which I thought about putting on today, and <laughs> um, you normally would wear one here, one there. Yeah. And the, one, the one here you wear is for yourself. Yeah. It was like you might have been given Mary or whatever. Mm -hmm. The one here you wear, is which would be like a grandmother's or mother's who've passed, passed on or something. So it goes on this side, like like the medals, like the yeah. four medals. And another one on the, because there's no button on the neck um, of the blouse. Yeah. So that holds the thing oh, together. Yeah. Yeah. Quite often I'd wear another one down there. Wow. They like they scarf themselves or something. Like the limit to how many places you can actually put these things. Right. <laughs> And they'll have the, the belt on the thing there, but um, I haven't got as far as the belt that I've got the buckle. <laughs> One day, maybe. But, um, you know, the, the other, some people, they, they, the different costumes come from different parts of women's costumes, or men's actually come from these. Um, the different parts of um, Sweden and Norway, especially, I know of. I'm not so sure about Denmark, but I think also. And they call the one that's the really big, flash, expensive one a Bernard, which is really tailored sort of thing. Um, my one is a um, like a folk costume, and I thought that's more appropriate for mm. a Kiwi who's coming, but it is the natural Norwegian one. Mm. And so it's interesting. <laughs> but I like to wear it, and I've got to wear it in a couple of weeks, and I thought, oh, I'm not wearing it here. Oh. It's not fun, and you've got to pick the damn skirt up so you don't cross yourself around the house. <laughs> And the absolute worst thing would be to have a um, car crash, oh. a car breakdown, and you're wearing this dress down to your ankles. Oh. So it's at home, and they just do this. So I think that's probably about it. Unless anyone's got some more questions, I'm fine with it. So we haven't been forced to be here to buy the clothes. I was mortified when I realised that. Good luck with your new novel. With my new novel, yeah. yeah. My new novel, I'll say, make it some love and then sort of keep it. I've got a now contact. What will you call it? The Fairy Man. Yeah. Who yeah. shot the Fairy Man? Oh, Abel Fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh. What a week, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well, I can reprieve you all of the reviews, but if anyone wants to come and look at these or look at this or have another review. I was trying to think, I, I haven't yet figured out how to do a um, overhead projection thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I could have done that, but I don't think I want to do that. So I'll just leave it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Carol, on behalf of the library. Go ahead and plant it. It's a big I have some idea of trying to chase up of printing newspapers. Oh, yeah. Papers past a certain limit. I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, that was the Learys. Yeah. He's got his print on that. And that they connected to you. No, 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 no. Just an intrigue. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's some fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It's managed to get an old, an old imperial print, print, printing press, which was, I think, the new second press. Have you seen the ones down at um, Foxton in the um, old paper mill, uh, old, old newspaper office down there? I really haven't. Mm. It's re I think you find it really interesting. Yes, no, it's just it's good to make an effort. Do that, yes. yes. I mean, basically, boxing was going to be it, and then the railway came. But they, they, they paid money for the railway to come to, yeah. come this way. So. Yes, it sort of. So, so it, 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 at least it kept going. It, 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 so that it, 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 it avoided boxing. That was the only thing, but probably it was a good thing because it kept off the um, sand. Well, yeah, well, exactly. Mm. Okay, but, you know, of course, there. I mean, those fields where our plots are all flooded. Mm, yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. yeah, no. Certainly. It's, it's, it's interesting. I, I did, I've done um, uh, research for um, Mangalchi District, uh, Horace Miller District Council for their district plan on various buildings and places down there. I think that's how they did it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, around the uh, Park Palace and uh, all, all, all around, I suppose. <laughs> Um, for um, various places, and yeah, it's fascinating sort of seeing how some of these places came about. But again, you know, even where the um, railway station was in Foxton is down low. You can see the internet, not you know, all the flood that you can get to. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's intriguing to sort of see this because I, I do a Facebook page on Palmerston and the railway station. Oh, okay. So, and um, so it's sort of, um, you know, all these things catch my eye. So the thing that, um, what's her name? Jill White published on Steam Day, that's yes. part of the other So it's intriguing. So it was good to Yeah. Mm -hmm. 